Niger in West Africa has long been a staging point for migrants and asylum seekers risking everything to reach Libya, the Mediterranean and then Europe. Now anti-trafficking laws introduced with the help of the European Union are said to be stemming that tide and reducing fatalities in the southern Sahara Desert. But not everyone is happy, as Juliana Rufus has been finding out. Checkpoint on the outskirts of Agadez, southern gateway into the Sahara. It is here that businessman Mardami Mossal dispatches vehicles that carry people and goods between Niger and Libya. Yo, Lendine, we come to the center here, Masu, passenger one and a half. Masu, yo, Lendida, my travail, Ama, Achimune, yo. Three years ago, pickups like these, filled with migrants from across West Africa, passed this barrier on their journey to Europe. Today, the flow of cars has become a mere trickle. The Nigerian government has passed a law that has made the transport of such migrants illegal. The journey between Niger and Libya is dangerous, and migrant deaths on desert roads have been frequent. The new law will save lives, according to the European Union, who pushed for its introduction. Men like Mardami, who organized the migrants' transport, had previously risked those lives. Today, Niger is the largest per capita recipient of EU aid, including funds to train guards at this checkpoint. <laughs> <laughs> but the EU has a vested interest. It wants to stop African migrants from reaching Europe, and it's been argued that by passing the law, Niger has helped Europe move its most southern border right into Africa. In return for managing migration, Niger is rewarded by Europe with lots of development aid. And if successful, this is a model that could be exported to other countries around the world. So we've come here to find out how it works. For centuries, the city of Agadez has been the gateway into the Sahara. Caravans departed from here and the 1980s saw a boom in tourism until a series of tribal rebellions turned the region into a no-go area. With the so-called migrant crisis in 2015, Agadez started making global headlines once more. Three quarters of all migrants and asylum seekers who reached the Italian coastline made the journey from Niger. Desperate to stem the flow, Europe struck a deal with Libya's Coast Guard to deter migrants from going to sea. With the introduction of the Nigerian anti-trafficking law, migrants and refugees were stopped even further away from Europe's shores. We have come to see Marami Mossal to find out what effect the law has had since it was passed three years ago. His compound was a so-called ghetto, a place where migrants and drivers gathered before starting the journey to Libya. After the law was introduced, the authorities arrested many of the drivers, calling them people smugglers. 
so she got one minute a little mother sent you, but like a minute a little by car at one little while, yes, and but such a little while. I actually got cost of Yagani open the inch. Buy the cho Yagani say, let the other one buy the cho, Sana Bashuahala. Before the migration ban, passengers paid around $250 each, meaning Maradami's profits might have been as high as a quarter of a million dollars. Mona Samo Kudiwanga, Kudiwana Kama, Bamutungu Daba Chenechi. Kudiwana, the Yuku, the Sendika, the Yara, Kanana, the Mine, Kuainechi, Kudiwana Bapai Lisa Kudiwana. Maradami's cars have been confiscated by the military and he takes us to see them. To make up for financial loss, the EU is funding a compensation scheme that helps former migration workers start new businesses. But ghetto owners like Mardami are excluded and are not reimbursed for confiscated cars. Mardami is a leader of the Tubu ethnic group that is home in the north of Niger and the south of Libya. Nine years ago, when the rebellion in the Agadez region came to an end, the government gave the Tubus the transport route through the eastern desert. Their role in cross-border trade means the Tubu are disproportionately affected by the migration ban. The EU has been investing heavily in stopping migrants from reaching its shores, but that's not all. It's also funding the return of migrants back to their home countries. This so-called transmigration center is run by the International Organization of Migration, or IOM, who arranges the migrants' return. Maurice Armel Miango Niwa shows us around. Most of them we receive here, they come from uh, Libya, where the political situation is not well, and then we are having also many informal prisons. The closure of the Mediterranean migration route into Europe and the violent behavior of Libya's militias has caused migrants to flee back into Niger. But the processing of returnees is not always straightforward. 40% of migrants we are receiving here, they don't have an ID. For many reasons, they, they can be lost or they can be confiscated. A crowd is building outside. Algeria's security forces are violently rounding up Africans, dumping them, quite literally, across the border into Niger. Algerian people, when they are deporting me, they seize my money, they seize so many things, even up to the phone to communicate with my family. Niger has become a repatriation hub, not only for migrants who get stuck here, but also for those who are being turned back in neighboring countries. We want you people, please, to fast track the, the departing time for us so that we will not stay here for a long time. We would like to go back to the country where they are from. Three buses are scheduled to leave. Bakari Kamara. A new group of migrants is starting their journey home. Bakari Magasa. When you see other people go, uh, how do you feel? I feel, uh, I feel the things that they are going before me, but everybody have his time. In 2018 alone, over 15,000 men, women and children have returned to their home countries with the help of the IOM. From Europe's point of view, the flow of migrants has been successfully reversed. But not everyone is ready to go back home. A contact takes us to a ghetto that is still operating in spite of the new law. Mohamed Balde has been picked up three times by the Nigerian military trying to reach Libya and now he's run out of money. He feels he's got nothing to lose.
Mohammed is from Guinea Conakry on the West African coast, a country that's seen violent ethnic clashes. We set off from Agadez to follow the route migrants take to reach Europe. Our destination is Dirkou. And from there, we want to drive towards the Libyan border. We will travel with an IOM team that's on a rescue mission, looking for migrants who are lost in the desert. A three-car army escort provides security. We soon get a taste of what travel in the desert is like. We're just outside Dirkou and we're already having the second puncture. Car breakdowns often leave migrants stranded in the desert. Our first stop is the village of Latai, where thousands of migrants used to drink water from this well. Today, military patrols are frequent, and IOM team leader Azawa Mauman is told that cars with migrants no longer stop here. Soon, we're back on the road, driving towards a nearby oasis called Dumba. It is known as a hiding place for migrants, a desert ghetto. Azawa wants to show us something very disturbing. Si, a un tombe. Pas vraiment? Hmm. Tête de quoi? De l'homme, des migrants. The driver who took these migrants avoided the main roads, but his car broke down. After three days of walking, the migrants arrived here. Donc, ça arrive souvent, mm. ici c'est des ghettos. Mm. They think it's a woman because of the nail polish on the toes. Most dead migrants will never be found. The IOM estimates that more than twice as many migrants now die crossing the desert as in crossing the Mediterranean. This is the signature. They were about 22, 22 migrants. 22 migrants uh, qui sont en train de partir et puis il y a trois qui sont restés ici. Incredibly, there is a well nearby. The migrants who died drank the water from the well too quickly. We set off again. After a while, Azawa stops our convoy. Asawa says he's seen somebody who's waving at us. The man's car has broken down around five kilometers away. When we get there, the head of our military escort, Ajidon Kadare himself, inspects the vehicle. When you're searching the cars, what are you looking for? Si la, la personne transportait des armes ou des, des, des drogues ou tout ça là, c'est ça nous, nous aussi, c'est pour cela on en fait la fouille là. Help is already on the way and we leave these men to continue their journey. Our final destination is a place called Mafrous, the last well before the border with Libya. It's a place where IOM has previously found migrants in distress. It's a dangerous place where gangs and bandits are active, carrying weapons that match those of our military escort. Ajidon Kadara decides where to set up camp. 
Je ne veux pas vous aller vous amener sur le puits parce que le puits est entouré par des collines et il est dans un bas fond. Qui veut être surpris par son ennemi Personne. Donc, c'est pour ça que je suis là, moi. At night, the military stops to patrol and bandits, smugglers and traffickers own the desert. As we make our beds, the guns are readied. The next morning, we descend to the well. So the ground is still wet. There were people here mm. really recently. C'est encore, on peut voir, il y avait des gens. Tu vois, il y avait des gens qui ont quitté très tôt. Il y a leur farine là-bas, ils ont préparé. Tu vois, c'est pour vous montrer que c'est un passage obligé. Donc les gens passent la nuit ici et continuent. Allez, chef, chef là It's time to start our long journey back to Dirkou. Since October 2016, the IOM team has rescued nearly 900 migrants. The overall number of Africans transiting through Niger may have gone down, but the ones who still attempt the desert crossing face a much more dangerous journey. Since our arrival in Dirkou, we've heard complaints that the migration ban has damaged the local economy. Nearly every family used to make money from the migrant transport, but now sales at the market have dropped and young men say they can't find employment. We have heard too that crime is on the rise, and to find out more we have arranged to meet prosecutor Musa Ibrahima. Bonjour monsieur, comment ça va? In the regional courthouse, he takes us to where the evidence is stored. These items were found by the military police less than a week earlier. That's what, that's hashish? It's hashish. It's hashish. It's hashish. It's hashish. It's hashish. It's So this was found in a, in a car that also had migrants in it? The police also seized weapons and ammunition. Some criminals seem to have a lot of firepower. This is not just for self-protection, that's for serious fighting. The easy availability of weapons from Libya, mixed with growing local discontent about the loss of income, has given rise to more crime. The prosecutor says some drivers have become smugglers. Ils ont changé de métier. Ils ont changé au lieu de prendre le, le, les migrants qu'ils se sont transformés en, en trafiquant de drogue, de tramadol. Comment c'est comme ça ouais. C'est la nouvelle activité maintenant. Ibrahima says he's been threatened with kidnap and even death. Merci beaucoup. Hein? And that he's hoping for more security, not just for himself, but also for his young family. And security is where the EU has been investing. This is the Nigerian police force demonstrating their new skills in the capital Niamey. They have been trained by the EU's Civilian Security and Defense Mission, otherwise known as UCAP. The occasion is the celebration of UCAP's sixth year in the country. Frank van der Meuren summarizes UCAP's successes. UCAP came to Niger to stop the rise of Al-Qaeda affiliated groups who had gained a foothold in neighboring countries. Since then, UCAP has trained around 12,000 members of Niger's security forces with specialist skills. This man explains how drugs are trafficked. Okay. 
Et après, on injecte ce qu'on veut comme produit cocaïne, héroïne et sarcène. A reception follows, but we manage to pry UCAP's head of mission away for a quick question. I want to know how worried he is about the impact of the migration ban. The traditional question, of course, uh, they say, okay, uh, the security will take off the jobs of our people. Of course, when they start the plan uh, to fight against uh, migration, there are uh, efforts uh, for put in place development projects, uh, like in Agadez. You say, they are, perhaps they are not uh, that visible as we want. It is estimated that since the introduction of the anti-trafficking law, Agadez has lost over 100 million US dollars in income. In response, the EU has spent $3.1 million financing projects that include training schemes and cash for work rebuilding Agadez's old city. But many feel it's too little and too slow. Meanwhile, the EU-funded compensation scheme for migration workers has come to a halt. After less than 10% of successful applications received business startup kits. We've come back to see businessman Madame Morsal. At his compound, Tubu elders are voicing their grievances. Les perdants, c'est nous. On a perdu notre véhicule, on a perdu de l'argent, et c'est eux. Et je sais pas, le moment, c'est à qui le droit il faut donner. Il faut donner à la personne qui a été blessée. They show me lists of names. So th these are all drivers. It's on two the chauffeurs. Et ça, ce sont two les chauffeurs, chauffeurs Tubu. Voilà. These are the Tubu drivers. Oui. Okay. Et ils n'ont pas reçu de compensation. Non, non, non. They didn't get any compensation. The Tubu have a fierce reputation, gained by fighting a series of rebellions against the central government. Son grand frère, il est mort là-bas. Dans le Russie, il est le chef de rebelle. Il y a aussi mon grand frère qui a été tué dans la rébellion. The elders say they have to calm their youth. Si on te voit un Tubu, tu es maltraité ici. On dirait que tu n'es pas Nigérien. Alors que tu es un Nigérien. Un Tubu, c'est un révolutionnaire. C'est révolte. Tu ne dois pas te moquer de lui. The men say the discontent may create an opening for religious extremists. Rubama, tarf. هؤلاء الناس هذه الافكار اللي طلعت الاخيره تو هذه بوكو حرام وداعش وجماعه هذه هذا مدور حمد لديهم افكار لديهم افكار يؤثروا في الناس حمد مثل هؤلاء الشباب الذين ليس لديهم اشغال وهؤلاء يتاثروا بهذه الافكار Their fear is justified armed religious groups have already made inroads in other parts of Niger the EU insists they are addressing this. The highest representative in Niger Ambassador Denisa Elena Ionete has granted us an interview. Is there the will in Brussels to act fast? The risks that some of the, the young people especially fall in the... Uh, they are attracted by uh, extremist movements, definitely uh, we need to move. We need to move fast. When the renovation of the old city was completed, Ambassador Ionete visited Agadez. She says the EU is also looking at Niger's development on a far bigger scale. We are working on, let's say, the next generation of cooperation, uh, which is using our resources as seed money for attracting the private sector, offering guarantees, not to say about the fact that we are providing the grand part of big infrastructure of financing for big infrastructure works. It's a, a catalyzer for further economic activity. Back at the barrier that marks the exit from Agadez, the guards are inspecting travel documents. We are told it's because we're filming and that the checks are usually a lot less thorough. But one man may have slipped through. Which country are you from? I'm coming one. 
Sudan. Sudan Darfur. From Darfur. You're going where? To Libya? What is your name? Ali Musa. Good luck. He's off before we can ask about his documents. As long as migrants want to travel, there will always be someone prepared to take them. The real challenge lies in addressing the root causes of migration, not just in transit countries like Niger, but in the migrants' home countries too. Until then, may those who still decide to travel be safe. <laughs>